Father, bless us now as we preach this sixth installment of, of the big picture series of teachings. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. We are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. Forgive my redundancy and my slow start. But I'm intentionally moving at a snail's pace in that I want it to sink in. Through him that loved us. Paul is not talking about uh, at this point, how much we love him, but that he loved us. Amen. We're more than conquerors, as I first stated. And that's, that's true. It's wonderful. But what Paul is stressing, the emphasis, has to be placed on that which enables us to be the conquerors that we are. It has nothing to do with our color or our gender. Not even your education nor statue. But for those of us today who are more than conquerors, it's because of Jesus' love for us. Amen. It is an enabling love. An encouraging love. It is a fulfilling love. It's an empowering love. And I'll tell you saints, it's an everlasting love. The love of Jesus is empowers the believer, enables the believer. It encourages the believer. And nothing is more fulfilling than knowing that Jesus loves me. Praise the Lord. Some, there are people who have never heard their mother or their father say to them, I love you. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus loves you. Amen. He loves us. And there is a proper way to respond to his love. There are things that we need to know about this love. It is Christ's, the Greek word is agapeo, his agapeo love. For us, that is God's intentional, self-willed love. God loves us and finds joy in loving us with our human selves. Things about us that's not so lovable. How many will admit that? Some of you think, well, everything about me is loving. You're the only one who has that opinion of yourself. And yet he loves us. And the God of the Bible doesn't love us by accident. He loves us intentionally. He set his love upon us. Amen. Amen. Scripture says we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. The question is, who are the us? Who are we? We are the called. 
according to verse 28. Amen. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And remember, I said to you the other day that the word call, the word is summons. The question is, whom or who did the God of the Bible summon? The truth is, he summonsed everybody. But not everyone is a part of the call. He has sent his summons out to everyone. When the gospel is preached, when someone is, has witnessed to you, that's the Lord calling you. Every opportunity that you've had for salvation, that's God's summoning you to himself. Amen. Um, but the call are not simply those who were summons, but those who responded properly to his summons. That when you heard the Lord say, come and get saved, you came and got saved. That puts you into the call. You have to answer the call to be a part of the call. If you're saying, I know that I should get saved, but I'm not ready yet. Well, you're not a part of the call. And you are not in the more than conquerors group. Praise the Lord. Are you hearing me today? I'm going to preach in just a moment, but I want you to, I want you to get this. Aren't you glad... Those of us who've said yes to Jesus, aren't you glad that you said yes? yes. See, one thing the God of the Bible won't do is he won't violate your free will. You have the right, if you so choose, to say no to Jesus. To say, preacher, I don't want to hear anything you have to say. That's your right. But what is not your right is the ability to control the consequences of that decision. One day, we will all stand before the Lord. And the Bible teaches that every man shall give an account of the deeds done in his body. See, on that day, there will be no tell your neighbor anything. You, can't, you won't be able to tell your neighbor and you won't be able to tell it on your neighbor. You got to give an account of the deeds done in your body. Amen. And you can't lie to God. Can't fix it. Are you with me today? <laughs> the love that Jesus has for us gives us the power to be more than conquerors. The next time those who say yes to Jesus, that's why saints ought not to, you know, kill yourselves. All this garbage about I, I could have lost my mind. I almost lost my mind. No, 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 no. Believers don't lose their mind. Don't let the devil make you that weak. Pray for me. I'm about to lose my mind. You better find it. Amen. Jeremiah almost came unglued. God said, get a grip. The Lord shook him and said, man, take hold of yourself. And one time he was complaining and just, you know, whining. Uh, and the Lord said to him, if you contend with and they weary thee. How are you going to contend with horses? I was telling Jeremiah, that trial you complaining about, that's a footman. You, you, you're in a foot race with another human being. So I got horses for you to run with. And if you can't handle footmen, you cannot contend with horses. Amen. Let the Lord make your mind strong. You don't like that kind of preaching, do you? The next time trouble 
rings your doorbell, think to yourself, because Jesus loves me, I will conquer whatever or whoever is at that door. Amen. Life brings challenges. Life brings surprises. But life will bring nothing that you can't handle if you just trust the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless my mother. Good to see you, mama. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Come on in, sit down, mama. Just bless You look good, mama. Oh, I can give my mama that. Give my mama a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. She knows how to make an entrance, doesn't she? <laughs> the next time. Trouble rings your doorbell. Before you even answer the door. Tell yourself, I can handle this. Because of Christ's love for me, I can handle this. That's big picture thinking. See, Because see, you're not drawing your strength from yourself. You're drawing your strength from your relationship with him and from, from what you know about him. Now we sing and say, you can't make me doubt him. Because I know too much about him. Well, I know this about Jesus. That whatever life sends my way. Paul said, there hath no temptation taken you. But such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not allow you, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation. When the temptation rings the doorbell, will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you might bear it. God knows how to bring you out. He knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Let's look at our text. Our text says, who shall lay Anything to the charge of God's elect. Well, who are God's elect? The elect refers to those who have been called. Again, according to verse 28, the elect and the called are the same group of people, human beings who've heard the word of God and said yes to Jesus. Once we've said yes, see this elect here is not just elect as in uh, the Jewish race, but this is dealing with all born again believers. The question is, who shall lay any charge, anything to the charge of God's elect? Amen. We are the elect of God. Amen. We're the ones who have been foreknown, predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ, according to verse 29. And them he called, he justified. To justify means to make righteous. And the ones he justified, the Bible says that he glorified. To glorify is to make renown. To recognize, to bestow honor on you. Believers have been justified. That is, we've been made righteous. And God knows how to take the made righteous believer and then glorify that believer. The elect are the ones who have God for them. According to verse 31, it says, If God, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, and he is, who can be against us? They, or we, the elect, are the people that God paid a dear price for. He gave his 
only son. God Almighty. For our salvation. The Bible says in verse 32. He spared not his own son. He that spared not his own son. But delivered him up to uh, for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything? That is, who shall bring any accusation against us before his throne? Oh, we can talk about each other all day long. But who is qualified to stand before the throne of God and bring an accusation to God against us? Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. Amen. If, if the one before whom we are guilty, and we are guilty of falling short of the glory of God, but if the one before whom we are guilty has pronounced us not guilty, what is there to fear from any accusation? If Jesus, once we accepted him, and got covered in his blood, whom we sinned against, has pronounced us not guilty. Remember, he justified us. That is, he pronounced us righteous in his sight. Oh, we got to grow now in our practical life. But I'm talking about our spiritual state. Spiritually, the Lord has forgiven you of all your sins. Spiritually, the Lord has pronounced us righteous. Glory to God. To God. Spiritually, we are glorified, and the coming glorification will match what God has done in us already. If the Lord has pronounced us not guilty, then how can the devil or anyone else come before us, before God against us, and plead a case against us. Oh, I hope you follow me. No one can successfully press charges, no matter how hard he may try. Satan is busy doing that all the time. According to Revelations 12 and 10, the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren who accuse us before God day and night. Satan is always up there pointing out or trying to get up there. The day will come where he'll never have access. He's always trying to point out the discrepancy between the profession of the believer and their walk. Oh yeah, as soon as you fall below the standard, there's the devil saying, see there God? They said they're saved. They claim to be such a Christian. But do you see what he said? Do you see that attitude? Do you see where they fail in this area? Yes, yeah, Satan is always um, accusing us, but he gets nowhere with his pretended zeal for righteousness. Isn't it amazing the devil trying to act like he's concerned that somebody is not living right? That's like a politician who is pro-abortion, pro-same-sex marriage, pro-homosexuality, and yet that politician have the nerve to stand up and say, I'm concerned about the morals of our country. Well, you immoral. How you gonna, how you gonna be for these things, but you're concerned about the morals of the country when you, your, your party program, uh, platform is immoral? Isn't that something? The de of all people, the devil's concern, he's accusing you before God. The devil. The greatest loser of them all. How in the world do you get to heaven? How do you, how do you, how do you, how can you be in heaven walking up and down in the mountain of God, in the throne of God, right there with God, and then get kicked out? I tell you what, uh, when I get there, ain't nobody gonna put me out. Amen. He was up there. Oh, my, those who, who, who don't want to be saved and 
who are serving the devil. You are serving the greatest loser of them all. In heaven and got kicked out. And then, and then we'll go up there and, uh, and try to accuse us before God. And bring up all of your shortcomings and everything uh, before the Lord. And why does he bring it up before God? Because all sin is against God. When we sin, we sin against him. David said this in Psalms 50, 51 and 4, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. That is, yes, you are right, in your charge against me. Because I sinned Lord against you. So God himself is the only one. Who can bring charges against us. That is God is the one. Who the, the, the Godhead. Who is arguing for us. The only one who is really qualified. To bring charges against us. The charges are accusations, public accusations. In verse 33, we see that no one can successfully press charges. I'm going to preach in a minute. Against God's elect. You can't convince God, the God of the Bible. You cannot convince him that his child who is washed in his blood is evil. Can't do it. No matter what. The devil said he can't convince the Lord that the Lord's child who have accepted Jesus as his Savior. The devil can't get up there, Sister Gloria, and convince God that his child is evil. Now the devil may be able to convince you that your brother or sister is evil. But if that brother or sister has been washed in the blood, hallelujah, even though they may have done a bad thing, and there are consequences to actions. Yet the devil cannot convince God that that person is evil. Because don't nobody know us like the Lord. And didn't nobody save us but the Lord. And whatever the shortcoming is, it wasn't against the devil. It wasn't against you. It was against the Lord. So the Lord knows. Oh my, this, this is a Thursday night teaching. Verse 33b, we find out something about God. Hallelujah. It says, it is God that justifieth. That is, Paul's argument is, it is God who has pronounced him righteous. You may try to lay a charge at God's elect, but the problem is God's already pronounced him righteous. I'm preaching here. And now in verse 34, we will see that no one can successfully, I know you can't hardly say amen, but no one can't successfully condemn us to Christ. We can successfully condemn people to each other. We can we can do, uh, uh, destroy each other. You know, we were teaching in class today about uh, the power of the tongue. And uh, uh, we talk about the passage that says life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I gave him an example of how, you know, that's not, that's not saying that uh, if, you get, if you get a disease, if you get a sickness, you better not mention it. Because if you mention it, you'll die. You know, uh, people, who, uh, people who got real conditions talking, uh, saying to themselves, well, I'm not going to claim it. Well, you, whether you claim it or not, you got it. That's right. That's right. I mean, you, you, you cannot claim it all day long. That has no bearing. That has no bearing on the, the reality. You, your leg, you broke your leg. I'm not claiming it's broken leg. It's still broken. Well, I'm not claiming it. Well, what, what is that cast for? Laying there in the hospital bed. They say I got this condition, but I ain't going to claim nothing. Well, you laying in that bed. You got something. That's not what the scripture means. If you say that, then that means you have it. No, if you, if you really want to look at the A clause of it, it is, um, 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 I can say to Mother Morton, Mother Morton, Mother Morton, Sister Renee is no good. 
Sister Renee is a mean person. Sister Renee is a godless person. Don't trust Sister Renee. She's evil. Now don't tell her I told you. But I just need you to know that about her, Mother Mort. I've just killed her. I just killed her in the eyes of Mother Morton. Oh, I can go to Mother Morton and say, you know, Mother Morton, Renee is first class. She's a fine young lady. She's to be trusted. She's a godly person. I know her personally. I thank the world of her. I just spoke life. See, it's not like you can go to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, funeral home and just raise people up. Go try that after service. I come in to speak life to y'all, all them dead people laying there. See how many get up. <laughs> See, bad doctrine hurts us. <laughs> Amen. So let us use our tongues properly, you know. The uh, Bible says in verse 34, uh, look at what it says. It says, who is he that condemneth? Are you with me? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen, and who is even at the right hand of God, and also maketh intercessions for us. Notice this. That qu the question is, who is he that condemneth? The answer is found in Christ. The only one who's qualified to eternally condemn a believer, if that were possible, is Christ. And Christ is not going to do that for, look at what it says, uh, it is Christ that died. So if you can't answer that, you can't condemn the believer eternally. Well, I can tell, I tell you right now, you're going to hell. I'm talking to a believer. All you got to do is in response, it says, oh, I didn't know you died for my sins. Wow. Whoa, I just learned something. You died for my sins. And, and until you die for somebody's sins and rose again the third day, you can't condemn them eternally. You can talk bad about them, and what you said may be true, but you can't condemn them eternally. For the only one who died is Christ. Verse 34 speaks to four aspects of the efficacious work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Have his efficacy, the, the satisfying work that he did for us is mentioned in verse 34. It says, it is Christ that, number one, died. Christ died, therefore, uh, secured the removal of sin's guilt and is risen again. He's alive and therefore able to bestow life on those who trust him for salvation. And then, where is it? He's at the right hand of the Father. That is, he is exalted with all power in heaven so as to represent us there and on earth so as to represent us here. He is more than a match for our adversaries. Jesus Christ is more than a match for our enemies. He's exalted. Praise the Lord. And then the last efficacious work is that he maketh intercessions for us. That is, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father pleading our case. Even as I stand here and preach to you and you listen to me, Jesus is pleading our call. So when the whole, when the devil tries to, to accuse us, Jesus is there to say, yes, but they've been washed in my blood. They're mine and, and I have them. And not only does Jesus plead for us, but you know, we've studied where the Holy Ghost in verse 26 says, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray as we, as we ought. See, we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh 
intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Ghost speaks to the Father on our behalf. See, because we don't know, we pray the best we know how. But sometimes the things that we're talking to God about is not the real problem. We just think that it is. So we're saying what we know to say, but sometimes even in saying what we know to say, we're not saying what needs to be said. Well, the Holy Spirit steps in and says, Father, other words, what they're really trying to say is, and the Holy Ghost fills in the blank. So we have the Holy Spirit interceding for us. We have Jesus interceding for us. He's at the right hand of God, exalted, interceding for us. Thank you. My God, this Jesus is both our judge and our advocate. He's our judge. He's the only one qualified to condemn us. But that's not going to happen because he's our advocate. He's the one who is arguing on our behalf. Am I right, Dr. McKinney? In the courtroom, you can't be judge and advocate. Can't be judge and a lawyer. In this thing, my, my lawyer, my judge is the Lord Jesus talking to the Father on my behalf. And my lawyer is the Lord Jesus, the paraclete, the Holy Ghost. He is the comforter. And they're all arguing for us. Are you following me? They are pleading for us. This is why you can't lose your mind. This is why you can't crack. When you realize that all of these things at all times are working on your behalf. How are you going to fall apart? How can you know all of this and give up on God? And give up on yourself and get so frustrated that you say well I guess I just can't make it I guess I just can't get well I guess things aren't going to work out uh, for me stop guessing and start believing and wait on the promise of the father oh my so I heard Paul after he uh, said these things he goes to the third who the first who was who shall lay anything at God's uh, who shall lay any charge uh, to God's uh, elect? In uh, verse 34, who uh, is he that condemneth? Well, now I heard him uh, bring up another who. In verse uh, 35, he said, who shall separate us? Who shall separate us uh, from the love of Christ? God Almighty, who? He personifies trials. He personalizes trials. Then ask right here, what? But he personified the trial. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Praise the Lord. He, he loved us enough to die for us. He loved us enough to rise again for us. He loved us enough to sit down at the right hand of the Father for us. Now he loves us enough to plead on our behalf. Who shall separate us? The word separate there literally means to put asunder. Just as the Bible speaks concerning marriage, what God have put together, the institution, let not man put asunder. Amen. So he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, first of all, he says, I want to show you something here. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes to some things. He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or so. Let me say something to you here. Notice he furthers the question. With situations that occur in the life of the believer. I want you to know that the fact that suffering happens in the life of the believer is not a sign. Wonder that Christ have stopped loving the believer. See, when, tri when tribulation show up, it don't mean that Jesus don't love you anymore. When pressure hits your life. And then, 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 you got to ask, Lord, have I done anything wrong? God, have you left me? No, the presence of pressure doesn't indicate that Jesus have stopped loving you. God Almighty, Jesus predicted 
that in this world we would suffer trouble. Jesus said in John 16 and 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. For in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Oh, I wish we were happy. Ah, there's a, there's a melancholy spirit that's coming over the church. Y'all don't hear me. You don't hear me. But all these sad songs, sad music, no joy. The lyrics are, you're saying the right things, but you're saying them with no joy. My God, if Jesus is all that, the song ought to jump. Jesus is that wonderful, it ought to put something in you. Ought to put running in you. Ought to put a smile on your face. Praise the Lord. I'm not for this stuff because I understand that what it's doing, the, the, the church has got to be the church triumphant. I can't get any help. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Not only that, but Paul reminds us that suffering has always been a part of the believer's lot. For Paul reaches out here and he grabs Psalms 44 and 22. And he says, for it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That is, we are facing death all day long. And we're considered by the world as nothing. The world is always trying to stop the believer. Good God Almighty, he asked the question, what's going to separate us from him? Shall tribulation, tribulation there literally means going through a situation where you're being crushed. Have you ever been crushed in this life? If you've never gone through a crushing trial, tell God thank you, but just keep on living. Mm -hmm. When that crushing trial come your way, don't think that Jesus doesn't love you. Because saints have gone through crushing trials down through the years. This is just your first one, but some of us, oh Lord, are veterans, and we're on our ninth crushing ninth or tenth or twentieth tribulation and we're able to look back and say the same God who delivered me 19 times before is going to deliver me again oh Lord isn't it good to know that he loves you even when you're in a crushing trial can I get a witness here he said tribulation nor distress distress is like being put in a box without the possibility of ever escaping sometimes life has a way of boxing you in you look to the right and you don't see anything you look to your left and there's no way out ahead of you there's a brick wall and behind you there's a concrete one and the floor is solid and you look up and you can't see anything I know that sometimes you find yourself in distress but while you're in your distress a lot of things will go through your mind but when the devil tell you that Jesus has stopped loving you you tell the devil in your distress Satan you a liar because he'll never stop loving me Ooh, Lord, and the distress. And then I heard him say, persecution. And this persecution has to do with when the saints are made to suffer. Hallelujah. It's when we are being derailed. When the devil is trying to set us up to destroy destroy us we're living in a day where there's a lot of persecution against the saints of God when we're being pressed for the purpose of being destroyed and then I heard him say famine self-explanatory when you don't have what you need to sustain you sometimes you go through and you just don't have 
the necessities of this life. Nakedness. When you don't have decent clothing, you don't have what you need to keep you warm. Peril is when there's danger and threatening all around. Somebody's married to a mean man or to a mean woman. Somebody who puts you in danger. Someone who, who, who walks in misogyny. Aha, he's a, it's a low down man that will keep his wife afraid that he's going to hit her. The devil is a liar. We're living in a situation. We live in a society now that if you even think politically different from someone else, they'll walk into the restaurant and try to run you out of the store simply because you believe something different from them. These are perilous times. And then I heard Paul when he said, will sword separate us from the love of God throughout the Roman Empire? The, the Christians were constantly being killed by the sword. Saints were constantly being sacrificed. And Paul said, shall these things separate us from the love of Christ? And he said, it is written that we are killed all the day long. Yeah, the devil is trying to stop us. But in my text, I see where Paul takes a sharp turn. I said he took a sharp turn. Have you ever took a sharp turn? He takes a sharp turn. He pivots and he goes in the other direction. When did he pivot? He pivoted around a three letter word. I heard him say nay. I need about 10 folk to shout nay. He said, nay, but in all these things, nay, good God almighty, in all these things, nay, literally, it implies some diversity, a super addition, nay, marks opposition, nay, serves as an antithesis to what has been said. He said, I know that we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. I know that the enemy count us as nothing. I know that they don't believe that it's much to the believer, but they can think what they want to. But that ain't what I think of myself. You may think that you can destroy me, devil, but I'm here to tell you that I have a nay in my spirit in all these things, in tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in famine, in nakedness, in peril, in sword, in all these things, instead of being defeated by them, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You ought to shout today, I'm winning right where I stand. You ought to tell the devil, you're defeated. You're not going to kill me. I am no sheep. I'm not going to a slaughter because I'm loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And his love is an enabling love. His love is an empowering love. He's alive! Oh! Oh, he's alive! Give me power to come out of tribulation! Power to survive distress! Power! Power to, to survive the sword! Yeah! Yeah, Lord! You ought to praise God if you are a conqueror. If you're more than a conqueror, thank him right now. Thank him. Thank him. Claim your 
victory. Change your mind. See yourself. See yourself in the winner's circle. See yourself with your foot on the devil's neck. See yourself coming out of that sickness. See yourself coming out of the box you've been in. See yourself delivered. See yourself set free. See yourself full of joy. See yourself full of power. Because Jesus, he still loves me. Jesus, he's with me. Jesus is pleading for me. Yeah, yeah. Do I have any persuaded people? He said, I'm persuaded that neither, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No matter how high I go, no matter how low I get, no matter whether I live or die, no matter whether it's an angel, a principality, something today, or things tomorrow, he's gonna love me, he's gonna see me through, he's there all the time. How many know that Jesus is with you? all the time and if you know he's with you you gotta praise him like you know it yeah don't be afraid whatever be tired god will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide god will god will god you yeah yeah Lord do I have anybody who's going through today is there anybody here that was a preacher I'm in peril preacher I'm in tribulation preacher the devil has been trying to stop me if you're here wave your hand and thank God for your victory, wave your hands and say, I know that he loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Yes. Brother David, wave your hand. Brother Littles, he loved you. He loved you. Sometimes you can't understand the way you take the, the journey. But just know, hallelujah, in your weakened body, he still loves you. And then that, that, that condition will not separate you from the love of God. And you know what? 
since, since, since no event, no situation, nothing in life will separate, will keep Jesus from loving me. That's right. That's the way. Then I ought to be determined that I'm not going to let any situation keep me from loving him. God Almighty, if you love him, you ought to praise him right now. If you love him, you ought to praise him. Woo! Woo! Praise the Lord if you love him. It's flu season. So take that fist and give your neighbor a fist bump. I'm not going to ask you to shake their hands. But give them a fist bump and say, neighbor. Mm, clear your throat. Neighbor. Use your preaching voice. Neighbor. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Yeah. Somebody praise him in here. Uh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hey, Rocky, hold the music. I want to hear the saints praise the Lord. for loving you. Praise him for loving you. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Woo! No principality. No power. No thing present, nothing to come will stop Jesus from loving us. And his love, saying it for the third or the fourth time in this sermon, is an enabling love. It's an empowering love. It's a fulfilling love. It's an everlasting love. So the Smith, his love says, you can get through it. I know the load is heavy, but 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 you, when you're going through, just whisper to yourself, well, this is my assignment. And Jesus, who loves me, uh, he, he knows that my shoulders are broader than they appear to be. And uh, he's going to see me through. Somebody praise God with us. Uh, Look at her getting her blessing on. Go on and praise the Lord. Somebody out there on Facebook Live, you ought to praise him because he will see you through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Whatever come my way, whatever happens, I'm not going to doubt the Lord's love for me. Mm. I just want to make sure that I keep loving him. Because sometimes when life happens, and sometimes because we don't understand, why things? Just let him praise the Lord. Go on, my brother. Get your praise on. 
sometimes we don't understand why things happen. And when it don't make sense to us, next thing you know, the love relationship is one way. He loves us, but we don't stop loving him. Stingy with our praise. Come to church with an attitude. You don't even see the point. I don't, I don't even see what everybody's so excited about. You don't love him. Told the church at Ephesus, you don't love me like you used to. See, that first love thing. I, I remember when you really loved me. I remember when you went after me. Jeremiah said, in the wilderness. I remember when I was ah, uh, the twinkle in your eye. Yeah, but now you come. If Rocky play long enough and the preacher holler loud enough and the praise team pull on you long enough, maybe, maybe then you'll tell him thank you. But let's make a pact. Since we know he's not going to stop loving us, he's not going to do that. Brother Barry, he, the things that he's allowed to happen to you and your wife, it's not because you're cursed. It's not because you've done something wrong. You ain't got to go back to the altar again with, Lord, do I need to check my salvation? No! Mm -mm. Here's what you say. Every, with everything that comes your way, I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to conquer this because he's he still loves me. So, and if he allowed it, I'm going to conquer it. I'm going to conquer it. Everybody in here, y'all, y'all, I'm going to conquer this. Don't, don't waste your time talking about why this. Well, Paul didn't say why. He said, no, and all these things will more than conquer. Persecution, tribulation, all that stuff, it ain't going to conquer me. Because Jesus loves me. I'll, I'll conquer it. That's the way you do it, Keller. We conquer it. Everything, everything God allows to come your way, it comes your way for you to conquer it. For you to, to, to survive it. For you to give it last rites. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Even when the believer dies, the believer dies in victory as long as the believer dies believing. Because Paul mentioned the sword. Sword there is martyrdom for the Christians who were killed. But the Christians who were martyred, no martyr dies in defeat. The highest honor in the Christian church, in the early church, the highest honor that could be given to a person was martyrdom. Hey, when, you, you, when you suffer martyrdom, they almost move you up there with the, with the Godhead. Oh, my. So, whatever... The Lord has allowed to come your way. It's for you to conquer it. Everybody who feel like conquering, meet me at the altar. I'm loved by the Father. And I'm loved by the Son. Loved by the Holy Ghost. These three are one. This knowledge... I cherish so Jesus died for me and I am loved I'm loved by the Father and by the Holy Ghost I'm loved and by the Holy Ghost yes, I said I'm loved
and I'm loved by the Son, loved by the Holy Ghost. These three are one. This knowledge I cherish the most. Jesus. Praise him right now. Woo. Woo. Uh, worship him right now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Lord, I learned something today. I learned something today, Lord Jesus. As a believer, I learned something today, Lord, that you'll never stop loving me. You'll never stop loving me. The presence of trials and tribulation is not evidence that you've stopped loving me. Oh, God. Life situations that happen to everyone else, when they come my way, it doesn't mean that you've stopped loving me. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, aches and pains and oh, that happen in life, it doesn't mean that you've stopped loving me. Oh, Father. And that love that you've given us today is an enabling love. It's an empowering love. It's a fulfilling love. It's an everlasting love. It's a keeping love. It's an amazing love. Mm, a wonderful love. Hallelujah, Jesus. We come today to the altar. We didn't come to ask you to keep loving us because you will never deny what you've done on the cross you'll never take back the efficacy of your sacrifice that you loved us so much to die for our sins and to rise again the third day and to ascend up to heaven and that you loved us so much that you're gonna come back and get us hallelujah Jesus we know that you'll never take that back but Father, we're on the altar asking you to help us because sometimes, Lord, we get in a bad way. Sometimes, Lord, we get upset with you. Sometimes, Lord, we get bitter because we don't understand. We get upset because the trial is taking too long. We begin to feel some kind of way because we feel like we don't deserve what we're facing right now. Oh, Jesus, forgive us of our humanity. Forgive us of our shortcomings in the name of Jesus. And we come to the altar to say we love you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. Love you because you first loved us. Love you because you died for our sins. Love you because you rose again. And love you because the love that you have for us is the love that's going to take us through every situation and every trial. Your love is empowering me right now. Go on and feel the power. Go on and let him empower you. That love is strengthening you. That love is healing your mother. That love is touching your child. That love is opening that door that the devil said wouldn't open. That love is giving you another chance. That love, the love of Christ, it changes. It changes things. Somebody ought to receive it. Or somebody ought to reach out and grab it. Somebody ought to believe for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your deliverance. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out with a high hand. Ah, coming out with my joy. Ah, coming out with peace of mind. Ah, coming out. Coming out with my hands up, with my head up. Hey, yeah, 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 Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Why don't you labor in praise? Why don't you labor in praise? Hallelujah. Thank him like you're more than a conqueror. Thank you like you. Thank him like you're a winner. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello. Think about what you've been going through. Think about it, think about it, think about it, but don't let it get you down. Think about it, think about Think about what you're facing, but don't let it get you down. Think about what you're up against, but don't let it get you down. When you think about it, just say to yourself, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I've already defeated this. I'm the winner. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above, not belief. I win, I win because Jesus loves me. He don't love that trial. He doesn't love that tribulation. He doesn't love that situation. He loves me.